Hello, I'm Nathan Laube, and I'm so delighted that you've joined us as we embark on this week-long recital from St. Matthew the Apostle Cathedral in Washington, D.C., with its magnificent lively fulcher pipe organ. Franz Liszt is not necessarily the first person who comes to mind when we think about the organ and its vast repertoire, but he was a giant among musicians in the 19th century whose influence touched every corner of cultural life in, the, in 19th century Europe. He was someone who spent his life in the company of important writers, thinkers, philosophers, politicians, uh, men of the church, whatever it may have been. And therefore, he brought all of this life experience into the music he wrote, which somehow just perfectly captures the moment in every instance. As a keyboard virtuoso, he had few peers. And in fact, his, his style of performing and his particular way of even situating himself at the keyboard, the first to sit sideways in such a way that performers, uh, that audience members could watch as he dispatched these incredible feats of pyrotechnic virtuosity. Uh, it, it was absolutely unique. And the phenomenon it created, the, the craze that it created among his audience members was uh, so extraordinary that even a, a term was coined to describe uh, the frenzy that surrounded Franz Liszt, Listomania. And, of course, he also was a great composer who paved new ground everywhere he went. Instead of using traditional forms like the sonata or the symphony, who sort of run their course through the incredible essays by Beethoven, for example, he rather decided to invent a new form, the symphonic poem, uh, drawing on all sorts of life experiences, you might say, or all sorts of stimuli that helped... Uh, uh, create these visions for musical masterpieces, whether those stimuli be poetry, buildings, his travel, his experiences uh, uh, with literature, whatever it might be. This sort of program music uh, became a fixture of the way in which he composed, so utterly uh, romantic in its whole concept, um, allowing for all of these earthly stimuli to help inform the musical expression and what you decide to bring forth in your musical expression. And the work that I'd like to share with you today, The Funerai, is a perfect example of that sort of program piece, this piece that describes the funeral odes, and a bit more. Much in the same way that Listomania, that spectacular phenomenon uh, surrounding his virtuosity and his worldwide concert tours, spread across world like the, the world like a, a wildfire, uh, a series of chain reaction revolutions also spread across Europe in 1848, the year predating the composition of this work. Those revolutions called for massive social changes, which had incredible implications on the social structure of Europe in the second half of the 19th century. But it also claimed the lives of many people. They were violent revolutions. And uh, at least three of those people were uh, people who were very much uh, close to Liszt and respected by Liszt in his native land of Hungary, at the far reaches of the eastern part of Europe, the Habsburg Empire. And these revolutions that started in Paris and ended in Hungary are sort of immortalized in a lot of musical compositions from this time, but Funerai is one of the most notable. And it pays homage to these men that Liszt wanted to commemorate in some sort of a musical tribute, which we find here. Interestingly, this piece comes just before Liszt's um, sort of dive into the pipe organ in its world. He was living in Weimar, and during that time, living in a city formerly inhabited by Bach, and where Bach wrote a lot of his organ music, um, Liszt ended up writing important essays for the organ, which also transformed the way that future composers would write for the instrument. Much like everything he touched, he opened up new avenues uh, for uh, ex expressive exploration and, uh, and, and caused a, a new sensations in the way that people thought and composed for the organ. But this piece comes just before written for his chosen instrument, the piano, but that of course adapts admirably well to the organ, uh, giving it a new life in a way, and a, and a new gravity that can never be fully uh, felt at the piano. The piece opens in the graveyard, a graveyard scene really showing the realities of the brutality of war with the tolling of the bell at the, at, uh, in the distance. And after a terrifying crescendo, out of which burst a number of fanfares on the most powerful trumpet stops played on the fourth manual, um, tr fanfares which do not sound heroic, but rather, you know, coded in the reality of the brutality of war, 
It's out of this gesture that the piece really begins, with its first theme heard on the lugubrious uh, bass register of the organ. You'll see me playing at the very bottom of the keyboard and using a very specific organ color that was ubiquitous on 19th century organs that Liszt would have encountered during his, his days in Paris. The voix humaine, or the human voice, It'll sound nothing like a human voice, hopefully not one you've ever heard. But in this part of the keyboard, it takes on a, a bizarre color almost. It's extremely plaintive, it's extremely dark and, and mysterious in its color, and gives and cloaks the whole scene with, with darkness and mystery. But that very same stop, uh, stop is heard in the second theme, which recalls the bel canto style of composition, of course, native to the opera house, which, but which was very much brought into the realm of the piano, you might say the nocturne, made famous by Chopin, for example, and also in the improvisations, liturgical improvisations of most Parisian organists of the early 19th century. These lines between the opera and the church were very blurred at this time, so it was normal to hear this sort of writing using the voyumen, the human voice, the opera singer of the organ, and you'll hear that including the, the tremolo, the vibrato of the singer. These two themes will intermingle for a while in the development of this work, in which both themes are tra transformed. First, the second theme, first heard very quietly, is now heard in a wonderfully rich rhapsodic passage, which gives way to the battle scene of the piece, one which many people have uh, postulated recalls the famous heroic polonaise of Frédéric Chopin, at one time, a rival, you might say, of, of uh, Franz Liszt, a, a giant in himself of the piano, and someone that Liszt met many times in Paris as they were creating music in the uh, setting of the salon of the aristocracy of that city. And um, it was actually Chopin who died in the same year as the composition of this piece, 1849, the year after those tumultuous um, revolutions. And that has led a lot of scholars to believe that perhaps this piece is also a commemoration of the death of his, yeah, once rival, and of course also great, great musician in his own right, Frédéric Chopin. After this erupts into, again, a, a, a furious climax, it's that first lugubrious theme, the, the, the very dark one that we heard earlier in the very lowest ranges of the keyboard, which emerges in the tutti sound of the organ with almost all the stops drawn in a terrifying um, apotheosis in this work. After that once again recedes, that second theme, the bel canto theme, uh, offers a brief reminiscence on everything which has transpired, and then almost recalling the opening of the theme, a uh, one giant tidal wave of sound uh, emerges and then recedes as quickly as it arrived, and the piece, all of that drama which has entered the stage, exits as quickly as it came. An extraordinary piece of musical drama, like a miniature opera, a miniature stage piece, um, or a small symphonic poem in its own right, which of course gives us the opportunity already in this first mini recital today to experience the full expressive potential of this great organ. So I hope you enjoy Liszt's Funerai, and thank you so much for joining me on this Monday. See you tomorrow.